gravity. Let's treat it like a mystery, because the generations that follow are going to say the answer was obvious. <laughs> and yet who has failed? Like the most awesome names in all of physics. Einstein, Feynman, Hawking, Witten, Weinberg, Walden, Wheeler. Now that's a clue. It must not be possible to do with the kinds of tools that we're using today. So let's go back to that to core tool. That would be the Riemann curvature tensor. Is that necessarily the place to start? Hmm. Well, who was Riemann's teacher? That would be Gauss. Gauss was trying to figure out ways to multiply collections of numbers together. And he came up with two approaches. Now, the first was good enough to publish, and he gave it to his grad student Riemann, and well, you know the rest of the story. The other one, uh, he left that in a notebook. He didn't really pull together the ideas together to say, you know, it's really just a number. And so eventually it was rediscovered and it had a really ugly birth. <laughs> and this has been ugly ever since. And in fact, I'm going to use a different label because I want to use something that's descriptive and explicit. That given the name alone, you'll figure things out. I'm going to call it a space time number. It's a number, so you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide it. And it's got space, three direct uh, dimensions for space, one for time. And I'll further specify that the time part is real, and the three space parts are imaginary. So now form all the products you can. Uh, a real time's a real, okay. And uh, a dot product, O oh, of imaginary numbers will be minus. And then you have the scalar times the vector, vector times the scalar, and then that cross product. Great. So if the cross product is zero, then you're talking about conformal geometry where you don't have the capacity to change an angle. That's kind of what the cross product does. Okay, from now on, all I'm going to talk about are squares. And for that reason, it's all conformal geometry because you always point in the same direction as yourself. So for special relativity, we take the square, we look at the real part, and we see the Lorentz invariant interval. That means two observers are moving at a constant velocity relative to each other. And if we think about their imaginary part, well, actually, we usually don't, which is a shame, because that can tell you exactly the motion between those two observers. Is it along uh, x, y, some combination? The answer is there. Now, for my gravity relativity proposal, you can't really do it in space-time, because you've got the origin there, you've got your origin. What we can agree about with this pointy stuff is in the tangent space. And so in the tangent space, yes, we take the square again, but this time the real part is what we disagree about. We do agree about the imaginary part. If, say, you're on the first floor and I'm on the tenth floor of the building. Now, how do these things change? Well, in special relativity, if the measurements of time and space kind of go up for one observer, they go, go together. Whereas if they go down, they go down together. And the reason is you take that ratio and you got to say, hey, we, we agree that the speed of light is constant for all of us. Whereas for gravity relativity, when the measurement of energy goes up, the other one goes down. Momentum goes down or vice versa. And what that means is that we see light bend. So we need those transformation laws. In special relativity, that Lorentz transformation will tell you how to move along hyperboles where the asymptotes are the light cones. Those are the things we agree upon the speed of light c. For gravity relativity, the gravity transformation will tell you how to move along hyperboles again, <laughs> where the asymptotes now are the momentum and the energy axes, because people agree that there is zero momentum in a system or there's zero energy in a system that you're both looking at. If you want details about how to derive these transformation laws, you'll have to look at the poster. But one of the relationships I got was the interval squared equals 1 over gamma squared dt squared minus a gamma squared dr squared. You get to use tools that are familiar from special relativity in this process. In special relativity, we observe the velocity. For the gravity proposal, we observe an escape velocity. And if we just propose a, the simplest possible function to describe the escape velocity field, an exponential uh, to the gm over c squared r, we get a result that's consistent with all weak field tests. Then that r does not have to be static. It could be dynamic, and in that way be consistent with gravity wave exponents. And finally, with that exponential, we actually get a result that at second order, uh, PPN accuracy present, predicts 12% more bending, but that's a rather hard thing to come by experimentally. Thank you very much.
post loot. This was my virtual poster presentation for the virtual APS meeting in 2021. You may notice that I talked pretty fast in that presentation. <laughs> that was because it had to be under five minutes, according to the rules. When I recorded it, I went on for too long. I had to speed up the clips so it came in at 4 minutes 59 seconds. The virtual poster session was on Sunday between 2 and 4 and one person stopped by in those two hours but did not chat. I received no data about anyone having watched the 5 minute presentation at all. So was it worth it? Yes for a couple of reasons. First, this was the first time that I used conformal to describe my approach to gravity, first formulated in 2015. I use conformal to mean angle preserving because there is no cross product. With quaternions, if there is no cross product, then all products must point in the same or opposite way. And this actually is a far simpler approach than what is discussed in the literature with metric tensors. If something is simple, but not too simple, that is a good thing. The meeting cost me $295. It may be that no one watched this video, and it is certain that no one discussed the presented ideas with me. What makes that a good expense is irony. The central idea of this talk is that future generations of physicists will be brutal in how they view us. I did not want to go to do a poster session. I thought I'd get the usual 10 minute talk before a group of 10 to 30 physicists and have two minutes for questions. Some small group of professionals going through a big pile of abstracts, decided that my proposal was such crap that it does not deserve a talk. It's easy actually to create a story where reaching that conclusion is reasonable. Say one of these hurried judges read and understood typical articles on conformal gravity. There is no mention in my abstract of metrics no mention of the vial tensor, no mention of the Einstein-Hilbert action, and so such a judge would find it wildly inappropriate to use the word conformal. Alternatively, I am not from a university, but from a website, quaternions.com, talking about quaternions, when the judge has only heard the word about quaternions a few times in their career. The true reason my presentation was moved from a talk to a poster was not shared with me and is lost in time. But let's end on a positive quote from John Wheeler that I liked so much that I put it on a lunchbox. <laughs> How can physics live up to its true greatness except by a revolution in outlook? that dwarfs all its past revolutions. And when it comes, will we not say to each other, oh, how beautiful and simple it all is, how could we have missed it for so long? Thank you very much.